Welcome back. My name is Andrew Mossman. I'm glad that you're here. We're going to continue with part two of our series on Bible prophecy. Last, in our last lesson, we looked at uh, the time of the end. Specifically, we wanted to know when the time would begin. Um, we found out that that was the year 1798. And now in this lesson, we're going to look at some of the Christian revival that was happening after 1798. In Daniel chapter 12, 4, Daniel is told to seal up the book even till the time of the end, for many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So we are going to start seeing people run to and fro, and knowledge increase at this time. What we have here is a picture of William Miller, who was a farmer. He was also a captain in the War of 1812. After that time, he ended up having a religious experience. He fell in love with the Bible, and he is remembered for his meticulous application of the prophecies. There's a quote here which helps us to understand how men like Miller approach the Bible. The language of symbols is not of arbitrary or uncertain signification, but is interpretable upon fixed principles. To ascertain and define which is the first duty of a commentator, as the judicious application of that language to the events of history is the second. That was Cunningham on the Apocalypse. Miller says something very similar. He says, history and prophecy doth agree. Now, quoting 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In our last lesson, if you're paying close attention, we shared a quote about Mr. Miller's belief concerning the 1260-day prophecy. And there were men like Crawley, even Cunningham, who we just quoted, Keith, and other great commentators in the past who had all come to the same conclusion as Miller, yet Miller discovered his beliefs without the aid of any commentary. So he must have been using the same rules of interpretation. He must have been using the same methodology. That's why they're arriving at the same conclusion. Here's a quote. Mr. Miller is a great stickler for literal interpretations never admitting the figurative unless absolutely required to make correct sense or meet the event which is intended to be pointed out. He doubtless believes most unwaveringly all he teaches to others. His lectures are interspersed with powerful admonitions to the wicked and he handles universalism with gloves of steel. This account of Mr. Miller is from the Reverend Mr. Springer of the Methodist Episcopal Church and the editor of the Maine Wesleyan Journal, from which we copy it. Mr. Miller, on reading the account, exclaimed, I have found one honest editor. Mr. Springer, it will be observed, is not a partisan of Mr. Miller. Another quote. In compliance with the wishes of Elder L.D. Fleming, pastor of the Christian Church in Portland, Maine, Mr. Miller visited and gave his first course of lectures in that city. From the 11th to the 23rd of March, the results of these was thus stated by Elder Fleming in April following. There has probably never been so much religious interest among the inhabitants of this place generally as at present, and Mr. Miller must be regarded directly or indirectly as the instrument, although many no doubt will deny it, as some are very unwilling to admit that a good work of God can follow his labors. And yet we have the most indubitable evidence that this is the work of the Lord. It is worthy of note that in the present interest, there has been comparatively nothing like mechanical effort. There has been nothing like passionate excitement. If there has been excitement, it has been out of doors among such as did not attend Brother Miller's lectures. 
At some of our meetings since Brother Miller left, as many as 250, it has been estimated, have expressed a desire for religion. By coming forward for prayers, and probably between one and 200 have professed conversion at our meetings. And now the fire is being kindled throughout the whole city and all the adjacent country. Several rum sellers have turned their shops into meeting rooms, and those places that were once devoted to intemperance and revelry are now devoted to prayer and praise. Others have abandoned the traffic entirely and are become converted to God. One or two gambling establishments, I am informed, are entirely broken up. Infidels, deists, universalists, and the most abandoned profligates have been converted. Some who had not been to the house of worship for years. Prayer meetings have been established in every part of the city, by the different denominations, or by individuals. And at almost every hour, being down in the business part of the city, on the 4th Institute, I was conducted into a room over one of the banks where I found about 30 or 40 men of different denominations engaged with one accord in prayer at about 11 o'clock in the daytime. In short, it would be almost impossible to give an adequate idea of the interest now felt in the city. There is nothing like extravagant excitement, but an almost universal solemnity on the minds of all the people. I would like to add in my own comment to this quote. Miller preached thousands of lectures, upwards to seven or 8,000 lectures. And throughout his experience, God was supporting him. These were the types of revivals that went with him everywhere he went. Now, this man that you see on the screen, his name is George Bush. And interestingly, he is actually a distant relative of the president, George Bush. He was considered the greatest theologian of his time. Um, he was a professor in New York City in Oriental Studies in Hebrew. And notice what that the man that is considered the greatest theologian of the time, notice his conversation with Miller. Look at what they're talking about. He says to Miller, I believe you are sustained by the soundest exegesis, as well as fortified by the high names of Mead, Sir Isaac Newton, Bishop Newton, Kirby, Scott, Keith, and a host of others who have long since come to substantially your conclusions on this head. They all agree that the leading periods mentioned by Daniel and John do actually expire about this age of the world. And it would be a strange logic that would convict you of heresy for holding in effect the same views which stand forth so prominent in the notices of these eminent divines. Your error, as I apprehend, lies in another direction than your chronology. Now, this is James White, and a few decades later, he is going to comment on this conversation between George Bush and Mr. Miller and notice his, that his insights are very useful. Mr. Miller held that the world would be regenerated by fire and Mr. Bush by the gospel at the end of the 2300 days. I'd like to stop and just mention that the world will at some point be regenerated by fire. Uh, however, Mr. Bush is wrong that the world is going to be regenerated by the gospel at any point. So let me start from the beginning of the quote again. Mr. Miller held that the world would be regenerated by fire and Mr. Bush by the gospel at the end of the 2300 days. The conversion of the world theory of Mr. Bush has had the terrible test of the last 32 years of apostasy, spiritual darkness, and crime. This period has been noted by departures from the faith of the gospel and apostasies from the Christian religion. Infidelity in various forms, especially in the name of spiritualism, has spread over the Christian world. Both these great men mistook the event to terminate the 2300 days. 
and why should Mr. Miller be condemned for his mistake and Mr. Bush be excused for his unscriptural conclusion? Mr. Miller made a mistake, but Mr. Bush had an unscriptural conclusion. A quote from the editor of The Countryman in giving the synopsis of Mr. Miller's views. The abstract of, Mist of Miller's views, which we give on our fourth page, so far as we give it in this paper, is and has been, according to what we have been able to ascertain, the professed belief of Orthodox Christians from the day of Christ's ascension into heaven until the present hour. Therefore, they are not merely Mr. Miller's views, but the acknowledged views of the Christian church, the received Bible doctrine. And if Bible doctrine, then they are truth. This last quote is similar to our first quote. It's a non-biased report. Uh, it's a non-partisan of Miller. Notice what they say. We do not concur with Mr. Miller and his interpretations of the prophecies, but we can see neither reason nor Christianity in the unmerited reproach which is heaped upon him for propagating an honest opinion. And that he is honest, we have no doubt. True, we think him in error, but believe he is honestly so. And suppose he does err in his views of the prophecy. Does that make him either a knave or a fool? Continuing, have not some of the greatest or best men who have lived since the days of the apostles erred in the same way? And who will say that all these, including Whitby, Bishop Newton, and others of equal celebrity, were monomaniacs and driven by a pitiable or culpable frenzy to the adoption of their opinions? The truth is, as we apprehend, that many of those who are so indecorous and vituperative in their denunciations of Miller are in fearful trepidation, lest the day being so near at hand should overtake them unawares, and hence, like cowardly boys in the dark, they make a great noise by way of keeping up their courage and to frighten away the bugbears. Now, there was a lady that attended William Miller's sermons, um, lectures, when he was in Maine. And her name was Ellen Harmon, and she wrote a very good book called The Great Controversy. On page 368, she records, to William Miller and his co-laborers, it was given to preach the warning in America. This country became the center of the great Advent movement. It was here that the prophecy of the first angel's message had its most direct fulfillment. The writings of Miller and his associates were carried to distant lands. Wherever missionaries had penetrated in all the world were sent the glad tidings of Christ's speedy return. Far and widespread, the message of the everlasting gospel, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. So we see the phrase for the hour. Miller believed and his associates that at the end of the prophetic periods, when these time prophecies would end, that that coincided with this hour of his judgment. So we can see that the first angel's message is a message in relation to time. Continuing, she says, the testimonies of the prophecies which seemed to point to. Note that, which seemed to point to. Not that they did, they only seemed to. Mark it. The coming of Christ in the spring of 1844. Remember that too, the spring of 1844. Let's read it from the top. The testimony of the prophecies which seemed to point to the coming of Christ in the spring of 1844 took deep hold of the minds of the people. As the message went from state to state, there was everywhere awakened widespread interest. Many were convinced that the arguments from the prophetic periods were correct, and sacrificing their pride of opinion, joyfully received the truth. Some ministers laid aside their sectarian views and feelings, left their salaries and their churches, and united in proclaiming the coming of Jesus. 
So I'd like to reference you back to part one of the series if you hadn't watched it. One thing that we had determined was at the time of the end, the little book would be open and the unsealing of the little book was a message in relation to time and that after 1798, knowledge would increase, people would run to and fro, and we see after 1798, we're in the 1830s and 40s now, there are arguments going forth concerning the prophetic periods. So we see a message in relation to time that has widespread application. It's going into every nation, tongue, and people. This is exactly what we would expect to see based on the prophecies. In the Great Controversy, page 457, the preaching of definite time for the judgment in the giving of the first message was ordered by God. The computation of the prophetic periods on which that message was based, the rest of the quote goes on to speak about the 2300-day prophecy. Again, this also shows us that this first angel's message is a message in relation to time. It's the preaching of definite time. It, and it's based on prophetic periods. Remember Christ in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 12. We learn this again in part 1. So reference that if you don't remember or haven't seen it. That Christ... In reference to questions that were given in time, how long concerning the vision and how long till the end of these wonders, Christ answers with prophetic periods and one of them is the 2300 days. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of this message. What I have on the screen is the second advent manual. It's written by Apollos Hale, who was a co-laborer, a close co-laborer of Mr. Miller. And he wrote a book that tried to take Mr. Miller's doctrines and condense them down for the common man. He writes, It is not the design of this manual to enter into the details of the Second Advent Doctrine, as held by Mr. Miller, nor is it intended to be, in any sense, a critical work. Those who may desire and have leisure to make the prophecies the subject of such attention must necessarily explore a wider field than would be consistent only to give the outlines of it in a work of this kind. So this is the outlines of Mr. Miller's work. This, this book is the skeleton of his doctrine. Its design is to present the events of history on which the calculations of the time are based. That sounds a lot like the Great Controversy quote that we read on page 457 with the text and some of the arguments which justify the application of the prophecies to these events, and to meet the most important objections which are brought against this application of the prophecies and the calculations of which it is the basis, the facts and arguments in support of all those prophetic periods only which are deemed vital to the system are contained in this work, the difficulty of access with many readers to the original sources of the information contained in this little volume, the oft-repeated wish for such a compilation, the desire that as many as possible may become established in what the writer considers the particular truth of our time. So if we wanted to know something about what Miller was preaching, if we wanted to get a concise overview of his uh, f fundamental p pillars, uh, his core doctrine, this is the perfect book to do it. It contains only the periods vital to the message. That's point one. Point two, it is an outline, not a critical work. And it's what the author, Apollos Hale, considers the particular truth for that time. And he would know well, since he labored so closely with him and was prominent in the movement. So, on the screen, we see Hale's four vital pillars, which are found in the book. Notice that they are prophetic periods. We have the 2520 as the first one, the 2300 days as the second one, the 1335 as the third. I also have sort of parenthetically um, at the bottom of that pillar on the screen, you see the 1290 because both those prophetic periods 
could be said to be one and the same. They both commence from the same date. That's why I say it that way. And then there's also the 1260. So here are Hale's four vital points. Apollo's hail was a part of something else that was very significant. It was the creation of this chart that we see on the screen. He made it in conjunction with Charles Fitch, uh, another notable preacher of the Second Advent, and J.V. Himes, who was a mover and shaker in the movement, he spearheaded the publishing work of the movement, was the one that published this chart. This chart was widely regarded as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. That prophecy is found in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and we will eventually in the series go through that prophecy. In that prophecy, it says that it would speak and not lie. As we can see on the screen, prophetic figures are circled, and these are the same prophetic figures that we see in Hale's manual. These are the vital points. So this chart reflects the information that we see in the manual, which is, are the vital points of Miller's doctrine. Now, from the same author that wrote The Great Controversy, who was a part of this movement, wrote, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them. Now, about 50 years later, Spaulding and McGann became very interested in learning about Millerite history. And so, upon request, were given this letter, which expresses the same thoughts, but there's some additional information. I saw that the truth should be made plain upon tables. That phrase comes from Habakkuk chapter two, that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's and that necessary means should not be spared to make it plain. I'd like to give you just a little bit of backstory um, on this letter and when it was written. This letter was written by Ellen White and it was in the year 1850. Now, the people that she is writing to are a group of mostly young people and very poor people. She says that, I saw that the old chart was directed by the Lord and that not a figure of it should be altered except by inspiration. I saw that the figures plural of the chart were as God would have them, and that his hand was over and hit a mistake singular in some of the figures plural, so that none should see it till his hand was removed. So the old chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and now we're given a caveat that not a figure of it should be altered except by inspiration. And she was writing this in connection with a new chart that would need to come out in the year 1850, and that's what we see on the screen. So now let's compare the two charts, because the figures were not to be altered except by inspiration. So inspiration was going to dictate what would go on the new chart. The figures were just as God had wanted them on the original chart. So now we see the two charts side by side. Apollos Hale and Charles Fitch made the first chart, and Otis Nichols made the second chart in 1850. So if we follow these arrows, we see that every single one of the figures that God had ordered on the 43 chart are carried over into the 1850 chart. They move into the bottom right-hand corner and also in the top. So inspiration has dictated that all of these figures are still truth. A couple key points. The first angel's message is embodied on the 43 chart. It was the message in relation to time. It was directed by God. The figures were as he wanted them. There was a mistake singular in the figures plural. Inspiration would oversee that the mistake would not find its way into the 1850 chart. So, truly according to the prophecy, it would speak and not lie. 
There is a mistake in these figures, and it's the Jewish year of 1843, which terminates in the spring of 1844. Remember, earlier in the presentation, there is a slide that says that the prophetic period seemed to point down to the spring of 1844. We're going to learn much more about that moving forward in these, in these presentations. Also in the bottom right hand corner, the, the title of that box is an explanation of time. We have the first angel's message still on the 1850 chart, condensed there, um, the chronology at least in the bottom right hand corner. In this slide, we have a quote from James White. He is the husband of the author of the previous quotes this quote is being written at the same time as those other quotes were, as his wife's quotes, and the subject matter is similar. He is also talking about the old 1843 chart. Notice what he says about it. No one will deny the fact that it was the proclamation of the time, 1843, as it was written on the chart that aroused the Advent people to look for the Lord. If that alarm had not been given, none would have been awoken to see the true light, and those who rejoice in the blessed hope would now doubtless be covered up in the mists and darkness of the nominal church. We cannot therefore see the least consistency in the position of those who call themselves Adventists and at the same time call the very means that has brought them to the scriptural faith and hope a mistake fanaticism, mesmerism, and have some have said of the devil. We see here that the name, the title Adventism is related, has direct bearing on the doctrine of the 1843 chart. I'll give you one more quote from James White to prove this fact. Here's a second witness. It was the united testimony of Second Adventist lectures and papers when standing on, quote, the original faith in all capital letters, that the publication of the chart was a fulfillment of Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. If the chart was a subject of prophecy and those who deny it leave the original faith, then it follows that B.C. 457 was the year from which to date the 2300 days. It was necessary that 1843 should be, first, should be the first published time in order that the vision should tarry. What does he mean should be the first published time? This relates to what was said in the Great Controversy where the prophetic period seemed to terminate. They apparently were terminating in the spring of 1844. That was the end of the Jewish year, 1843. That's the context. Continuing in the quote, or that there should be a tarrying time. We are going to later look at a tarrying time found in the parable of the 10 virgins and in the prophecy of Habakkuk chapter two, in which the virgin ban was to slumber and sleep on the great subject of time, just before they were to be aroused by the midnight cry. By the end of these presentations, you will appreciate this quote and all of its bearings. So stay with us. In the next presentation, we are going to be looking at the weight of evidence. We are going to be investigating each of the vital points as found in Hale's second uh, Advent manual. But in addition to that, we're going to be also studying other prophetic periods and doing a more critical work, a more critical examination of Miller's views. So I, I look forward to having you in the next presentation. Thank you so much.